Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Advocata's AdvoChats discussion. AdvoChats tackles today's most pressing economic conversations. I'm Migara Rodrigo, and I'll be your host for this evening's discussion. Today's topic tries to explore the challenges facing Sri Lanka's social safety net, which consists of 35 key programs such as Samurdi and consumes expenditure equivalent to 4.2% of GDP, and it is in dire need of reform to improve both coverage and efficiency. Joining us today are two experts with significant experience in researching this topic. They are Rehana Taufi, Independent Economist and Research Associate of Advocata, and Gayani Hurulle, Senior Research Manager at Learn Asia. Welcome to you both, and thank you for joining our discussion this evening. Before we begin, a housekeeping request to all of our listeners today. We will, we will be taking questions from the audience. This event is being streamed on Instagram, so please send in all questions in the comments section. Okay, let's begin. Uh, question number one. Given the severity of the present crisis, and with the number of people living below the poverty line having doubled since 2019, what do you think the government's first priority should be when restructuring the social safety system? Rehana, do you want to go? Uh, sure, you can hear me. Uh, so I think the one of the main issues that has been highlighted consistently in uh, previous research as well, and it has come uh, come about even in discussions with regard to the crisis as well, is the targeting issue. Uh, there is uh, there are lots of issues, uh, especially in the in the uh, poverty alleviation programs. Uh, where they aim to give some sort of basic income to people. There is uh, quite a lot of uh, issues with regard to targeting. And then what happens is we end up excluding people who should be part of the program. Uh, and we also include people who are on the higher uh, income spectrums who should not be part of the program. So what that does is uh, you know, it, it fails to really meet uh, the uh, social security needs of some people. So I think the main issue that needs to be addressed is uh, the targeting problems. Gaini, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly uh, an important point and something that we do need to work on over time. Um, I'd almost have a slightly different take on it. And I think this goes back to the different elements that we need to sort of address when dealing with social safety nets and also being cognizant of the fact that we are in an emergency crisis sort of situation, right? So there are a couple of things that we need to think about. And this is just the broader spectrum in it, which we're working in. We need to make sure that uh, people get enough assistance, right? And this goes back to say the 5,000 rupee grant that was first given in um, April, 2020, I believe. Given the amount of inflation, hyperinflation that we've seen over the past few months, uh, we need to make sure that people are getting enough money, right? So to me, that would be the first thing that we deal with. We need to make sure that it's accessible to people. Right? Because, you know, right now it's being given through different types of means. Uh, are people able to actually go and get it? Right? And something that we have been pushing is perhaps to look at uh, giving it through uh, bank transfers and so on. So that to me is the first thing that we would be dealing with purely because it's uh, a crisis situation. But in the long term or even long to medium term, fully agree with Rehana that um, the targeting issue is something that we need to work on. Okay, thank you. Uh, given that we've already broached the problem of effectively targeting the social safety net, do you, Gaini, have any proposals for how we can improve our targeting? Yeah, so this is something that I've been thinking about a lot over the past weeks, and uh, everyone else at Learn Asia too has been thinking about this. So the long and short of it is that we really need to take a much more data-driven, evidence-based approach. And this depends on whether you're trying to identify the systematically poor, people who've been below the poverty line 
you know, for many years, or whether you're trying to deal with uh, people who are newly poor, right? People who've just uh, lost their jobs or something like that. Because what you're going to find is that uh, you take, you can, there are different means through which you can look at this. So say you look at somebody's house and you would be able to get uh, some sort of sense of where they are in terms of their socioeconomic classification. But um, that person may have lost their job, their main income earner may have passed away. So then there is a need to sort of look at different means to see whether they are in or out, right? So then there's uh, a little bit of nuance that needs to be look at, looked at over there. But there are also new data sources along with things like assets, which have traditionally been used and traditionally been proposed that can be used. Like uh, electricity consumption has been shown to be quite effective in showing where people are. Uh, mobile uh, call detail records, all those are, are shown to be very efficient. Uh, there are studies from Togo and so on, which, you know, I could go on and on about, but but I won't. So those are different ways through which uh, we can we can look at different mechanisms. There's also a need to think about uh, different types of indicators for different geographies and different types of populations. So an indicator of poverty for someone living in an estate sector, for example, would be quite different to someone who's living in a fishing village, right? So you do need to think about this from a, a more geographical or demographic lens. And uh, in Mexico, for example, in you know the really successful Progresa programs that they've been doing, they have different indicators for people in urban and rural poverty. Uh, Brazil has different types of indicators for people in different municipalities. So I think we do need to go um, towards that sort of system. Of course, um, all these types of data-driven targeting will only help us get to a certain level of accuracy, right? There is no 100% way of getting there. So to counteract that, you do need an appeals process. You need to be able to say, put up a list where someone can say, hey, you know, this person seems to uh, qualify through X and Y mechanisms, but they also have so many other means of getting income and perhaps shouldn't be there. Um, and, you know, vice versa, then if somebody is uh, found to be really poor but doesn't meet the eligibility criteria, they should be able to come in. So you need a strong appeals process. You need to make sure it's depoliticized because that's another big element. So all that really needs to come together to make sure that we have a good targeting system. Thank you. Uh, Rehana, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I think Gayani covered most of it, but something I'd like to mention is that uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, so as you mentioned, there are 35 uh, social security programs and all of these uh, are quite disjointed. Uh, they are operated by a variety of ministries, um, uh, you know, introduced at a variety of different times. They, the, the, the payment mechanisms are different, how they are funded is different. Um, but still, I feel like uh, Sri Lanka continues to think of uh, social security as something uh, for the poor. Uh, but actually, like if you look at how other countries, uh, developed countries do it, uh, social security is essentially for every citizen. Um, uh, what we call a lifestyle, uh, sorry, a life cycle approach where you uh, aim to provide social security for people from uh, childhood up until old age. Because uh, the, the premise is that you never know, uh, as Gaini said, because there might be someone who's living in a, in a big house, but they may have lost their job and their income uh, source, and they are not able to actually uh, you know, uh, meet their day-to-day -day expenses. Uh, so I think, uh, in, in a sense, Sri Lanka also needs uh, to change the way it thinks about social security. It's not just for poor people. It's not just, uh, you know, targeting uh, poverty, but it's really, it's it's to cover everybody in the country because, uh, you know, any one of us are vulnerable. We could, you know, lose our job today or we could be in an accident and be disabled. Uh, so, so all, you know, I think there needs to be sort of a mindset change uh, when it comes to policy making as well uh, from the government side. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. Right. Thank you, Rehana. You brought me along neatly to my next question. Uh, so one potential framework for Sri Lanka to follow is the ILO's 2012 Social Protection Flow Framework, which calls for access to a sort of flow 
of social safety uh, and access to essential health care and basic income security for all. Do you think that this sort of framework is tenable in Sri Lanka, given the economic crisis and the government's shortage of money even to pay their own salaries? Uh, I mean, at the moment, uh, introducing a new program where you cover parts uh, of social security which you didn't before. Uh, for example, we, we already have free education, free health care, and some old age pension schemes. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, obviously we don't have the fiscal space right now to think about a, a very comprehensive and holistic uh, social security uh, a program like that, but uh, I think the social protection flow of the ILO program is uh, is a good starting point for a, a medium to long term policy for Sri Lanka because I think it it covers childhood, uh, maternity, uh, I think working age and old age pensions. So and Sri Lanka has also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, ratified some of these conventions with the ILO. Uh, it's just that we haven't really taken steps to meet uh, these requirements that have been uh, set forth. Um, for example, if we take pensions, the only uh, pension program that would, uh, you know, uh, satisfy the requirements of the social protection flow would be the civil pensions uh, program. Uh, none of the other programs, not, neither the EPF nor the ETF, uh, nor any of the other variety of uh, ad hoc uh, pensions programs we have would suffer, you know, would meet the requirements of the social protection flow. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There are some programs that need to be, uh, you know, brought up to scratch. Uh, uh, so I think it's a good framework for the medium to long term, but obviously in the short term, we are constrained by the uh, effects of the crisis. The government just doesn't have uh, enough uh, funds to uh, really establish new programs. So, uh, and I think even some of the existing programs, there needs to be changes uh, that have to be undertaken. So I think, yeah, currently we are not in a position to undertake it, but definitely in the medium to long term, something to think about. Thank you. Uh, Gaini, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think Rehana has covered most of it, but I think uh, what I'd like to do is to emphasize uh, the fiscal space in which we operate in, right? Because that's really the challenge and that's going to be the challenge for most of the things that we're talking about today uh, because we're dealing with a situation with limited funds. So we need to make choices about things like this. But if you look at um, our performance in terms of how much money we've spent on social safety net uh, historically, and you know, this goes back to the fact that social safety nets covers a whole gamut of things. Uh, it's been uh, quite low and in many cases, the expenditure has been declining as a percentage of our GDP. So that's quite, that's quite worrying. So even in the long term, as we you know, try to ratify these kinds of programs and work towards reestablishing a proper social safety net, we will have to make hard choices. We'll have to think about where we're spending our money. So, you know, it's something that certainly Rahana has spoken about in terms of cutting down defense expenditure, cutting down on vanity projects, and redirecting money towards uh, causes, merit goods to help your people, because you know that's really what we'll need to spend on in the long term. So that's just to add to what Rahana said. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, while we're on the topic of cutting down expenditure and making our system, our existing system more efficient, uh, have been calls to sort of consolidate Sri Lanka's various welfare schemes and programs and to create a unified recipient database. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and what would the advantages of this be? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. So the, the premise of this, like you mentioned, is that we have 30 plus schemes and many of these are run by different agencies, right? So the administrative burden of this is really high and something that could be streamlined. So that's the very quick answer. But if I was to elaborate on this further, when there are 30 plus programs, there are 30 plus lists, right? So you have a summary list, you have a disability beneficiary list, you'll have a thalassemia aid list, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So when you don't have a consolidated database, all these exist in silos and then 
you know, you can't see whether the person who's getting some of these is also getting disability, is also getting thalassemia AIDS. So there's some level of opaqueness there, right? So um, having all this information together in one place gives you a good sense of the assistance that people are getting, right? So that's the, the, the big benefit. Uh, but it can also help people, and that's in terms of, you know, what economics, uh, economists call transaction costs, right? So say uh, you have a recipient who is on five different lists, and say uh, a recipient has passed away, then their next of kin, uh, instead of going to five different agencies and, you know, telling people that, that uh, this person has passed away five times, uh, you can go and uh, address it to one agency, it will be updated on the list, and then, you know, your transaction costs will be reduced in that, right? So even from a user perspective, that definitely makes sense. But of course, just creating the database alone isn't enough. You need to make sure that it's maintained, that it's used, and traditionally in more eGov types of projects, this is what we've seen as the, the biggest challenge. So building the database is very important. It can have benefits, but of course, if it's used properly. Right. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think Gayani sort of covered the administrative part. I'd just like to add now, because there are multiple administrators, there's also somewhat of a duplicitous, you know, you're doubling the work. Uh, so something that could be done by one agency, you have 35 uh, of you know, 30 different agencies doing it. So uh, when you consider it from a government perspective, then you are sort of doubling the administrative cost. Uh, for example, in the Samurti program, about 25% of program expenditure is administrative expenditure. But this is not necessarily the case in other, uh, other programs run by the government. For example, the civil pensions program has a very low administrative cost. Uh, so you can see the benefits uh, of sort of linking everything together, like, uh, you know, Gaini pointed out. Uh, but also we would save a lot on administrative costs and we would be able to achieve a better cost benefit, uh, you know, uh, out, outcome from uh, sort of consolidating into uh, one program. And then obviously it's going to be much easier to administer uh, a program from one centralized agency and then uh, you know it, it reduces the burden on people as well like uh, Gaini said. Right, thank you. Uh, while we're on the topic of uh, Samurudhi, LearnAsia has continuously advocated for the expansion of the cash transfer system. Uh, in Sri Lanka this primarily takes place through Samurudhi. Gaini, what is the benefit of this type of welfare instead of, for example, in-kind transfers or a voucher system? Right. So uh, just, to, just to be clear, uh, there are different types of cash transfer programs, right? So you have Samurti, you have, um, you know, in terms of an emergency grant, you have the 5,000 rupee grant, right? So there's a, a whole series of different types of cash transfer programs. So this applies to many of these. So really the, the long and short of it here is that the benefits are multifold, right? And you know, the randomized control trials done from multiple different countries, which is really the most rigorous type of evidence shows that it helps with dealing with a whole lot of different issues. So food security, financial stability, uh, increasing people's savings, increasing people's mental health, you know, all those are shown to be uh, associated with cash transfers made be conditional law unconditional, right? So it addresses a whole lot of issues, uh, but it also can work uh, if implemented properly because it's relatively simple to deploy, right? So pushing it out is quite easy. It reduces leakages if well implemented, right? Now, of course, the, the issue with uh, cash transfers and something that we've seen in Sri Lanka is that there are issues in terms of how people are selected to the program, how people are sort of, uh, how it's distributed. So those are all issues. Uh, but if you use things like, you know, good uh, selection mechanisms, if you uh, push these transfers through like say bank accounts or whatnot, there is the possibility of making this a lot more streamlined, right? So in a well-functioning system, it can work. It gives households the uh, autonomy also to prioritize their expenses, right? Because you'll find that not every household 
will want to spend their money the same way, right? So say somebody has a young child even, for example, one may want to spend a little bit more money in terms of electricity and, you know, helping their child stay up late at night and study. One may want to spend on sending them to a tuition class. Some may want to buy some books for the child. So, you know, it's a, you really need to give uh, people the autonomy to give them some sort of control over their lives and figure out what works best for them. And most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, um, it provides an injection into the economy, right? And what that means is that not only will the recipient benefit, what will happen is that they will also spend this money at their local grocery store and then they will, you know, it will be income for them, they will spend it. And, you know, this has shown to have this multiply effect that we talk about in economics. And there's evidence from countries, uh, unfortunately, I can't remember what specifically it is, but a uh, uh, cash transfer of a few cents has resulted in a multiply effect, which results in like a benefit of, you know, two point eight two or something like that. So it's significant. So we really do need to think about it from that lens. Now, of course, again, we have to be pragmatic because the issue sometimes with cash transfers is that you need to make sure that there are things for people to buy, right? Now we've heard seeing in the case of medical aid or that there is a case to be made in that sort of sense because the goods just aren't available. So then even if people have money, they can't buy it. So you have to be pragmatic about things like that in the in the short term, in this emergency situation. But in the long, medium term, uh, cash transfers are really the way to go, we feel. Right. There's something of a misconception, I feel, among a lot of people that if a full cash transfer system is embraced, there is a propensity for people to spend that money on demerit goods like alcohol or drugs or whatever. This argument doesn't really have any merit, does it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, we're going back to the evidence here, and there are these systematic reviews from multiple different countries, from Asia, Africa, Latin America, which show that this isn't necessarily the case, not that people won't spend on things like this, it just won't significantly increase uh, the consumption versus what they usually would have had. And I don't know, Rehana, I know you've, you're you familiar with this study and you've been looking into this area as well, so I don't know if you want to jump in on that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's totally a misconception that's being debunked, uh, I think, through many uh, randomized control trial experiments and studies. Um, uh, that, you know, people don't necessarily use uh, the cash transfers they receive to go and spend it on demerit goods. Uh, they actually, uh, you know, what several of the studies have shown is that, um, you know, for example, a cash injection into the household would uh, increase, uh, would improve, for example, the uh, children's education outcomes, uh, the children's health outcomes, uh, you know, things like that. So there is a huge uh, positive impact uh, that ca cash transfers have proven. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, whole, uh, you know, this whole people will spend this, this bit that people will spend on uh, demerit goods is also coming from um, that perspective that, uh, you know, people have that the poor don't uh, really know what to spend on uh, you know, they don't know how best to budget or they don't know how to, uh, you know, what what goods to go and buy. So I think that mentality, again, uh, you know, something systemic in, uh, I think, Sri Lanka and many other countries as well, where that, you know, that's why we think of social security as something for the poor. Um, because, you know, uh, we, we think that somebody sitting in a Colombo, uh, you know, office knows better than, uh, that person and uh, or a mother, you know, or someone from a low income family about how best to use that money for her family. Uh, so I think uh, definitely when it comes to uh, in kind transfers, I think that's the whole mentality that people will uh, act well, not in this particular crisis, because Gaini mentioned a very important point, which is that, you know, obviously at present, because there are so many shortages in, uh, you know, goods, it's it might be uh, pragmatic to consider some kind of in-kind transfer, but in general, uh, in general, a cash transfer has proven to be a better, uh, you know, better mechanism than in-kind transfers. And I think uh, 
uh, also you know the administrative costs of an in kind uh, you know transfer where the government has to procure uh, the the goods that they want to distribute and then they have to create a distribution uh, network uh, so there's a there's a huge administrative cost whereas you can do a cash transfer very uh, sort of very low cost uh, cash transfer uh that doesn't cost as much as a in kind uh, program would and i think uh uh gaini also mentioned this that it's going to benefit the local community a lot because people will be spending that money uh, you know they would go to the grocery store nearby and they would uh, buy from uh, you know they are known grocery store but if you if you talk about uh, a, a centralized distribution scheme then some you know the beneficiary is going to be Uh, some really big uh, import uh, uh, importing company which is able to provide uh, you know massive amounts of stocks for the government uh, so i think it has definitely has uh, um, a different and a more sort of uh, beneficial outcome for the economy uh, as as a whole uh, yeah yeah absolutely that bottom up approach as advantage should not be underestimated uh on the subject of reducing the administrative costs uh gaini already mentioned uh the system of using direct bank transfers or mobile money apps uh the latter system has been implemented successfully in countries like kenya given sri lanka's existing infrastructure do you think that this sort of system could be rolled out uh in a timely manner yeah so there are a couple of ways to deal with this right so you can look at mobile money which is one one mechanism um the the issue there it, it's shown to have a lot of different cash out points there's a, a lot of benefits that can come out of it uh, but the issue there in sri lanka really is that the current penetration of mobile money is quite low but it does have the potential to be used because the mobile penetration itself is low right so a lot of people have mobile phones uh, although they don't necessarily use mobile money services right so the potential to scale up is quite high uh, but we also can use the bank transfer system which i think people are a lot more familiar with it's already used for pensions it's already used for a couple of other types of programs it's actually even used for samudhi though in the case of samudhi they have a dedicated samudhi bank which then you know speaks to another issue of high administrative costs and you know digitization and what not so even if these transfers can be directly sent to bank accounts not necessarily some of some of the but you know other types of banks uh, it it could work and even if you take um, the, the the bank transfer sort of system uh, there is a perception that many people are unbanked particularly people in the low income thresholds people who are generally receive welfare that they are unbanked Uh, Lanisha did a survey in 2021 national representative and what we found is that 30% of the households in general receive welfare and of those 33 uh, sorry 30% uh, 77% of the households have access to a, a bank account so that certainly is tenable i think people may be a little bit more used to it so that may be uh, another mechanism through which but uh, it can be done but um, I don't I'm not quite as pessimistic as uh, some others. Right, Rahana anything to add to that? No, I think Lanesia has uh, done like a bulk of work on that so I'll leave it to Gaini. Okay. And uh my final question around the whole Samurdhi system uh given the present uncertainty that we're facing around prices and sri lanka's extremely high inflation rate how should the government hedge the social safety net against price fluctuations particularly regarding subsidies and cash transfers so i think there has to be definitely some sort of inflation uh, indexations so that you you know sort of increase the benefit based on the inflation levels I think the way it has happened, particularly with Samudhi, is that it's more ad hoc. So it's decided by ministers. You know, okay, fine, we'll give a 500 rupee increment to everybody, or we'll give a 250 rupee increment to everybody. So it it because it's a highly politicized system, 
you know, the Samur itself is highly politicized. So, uh, you know, on the election trail, politicians will be promising we'll increase Samurdi by this much. Uh, we'll get more people into Samurdi. Uh, so I think there definitely needs to be some sort of inflation uh, index where you, uh, you know, increase the benefit according to uh, the way that inflation is going. But then it goes back to Guyanese's original point of whether that, uh, you know, base amount itself is adequate. Um, so I think uh, on average, the Samurdi payment is about 2,500 to 3,000 rupees uh, per beneficiary. There are about 1.8 million beneficiaries in the program at the moment. Um, so, I mean, all of us know that that's not enough, right? That's simply not enough, particularly uh, in the current context where inflation is, I think, the most recent number is something like 50%. Uh, and food inflation is much higher, I think, exceeding 60% as well. Uh, so, you know, th there definitely needs to be a rethink of that base value uh, and the adequacy of it. Right. Gaini, uh, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, absolutely agree. I think the sum of the amount does need to be increased significantly uh, and obviously needs to give, be given to the right people. Even the 5,000 rupee grant, I'd like to reiterate, needs to be increased. Uh, we've done some inflation adjusting for that, and we see that I think about 8,000 rupees needs to be given if we are to get the same outcome as we would have in April 2020 with the 5,000. And I'm not saying that the 5,000 is enough, but to get the same outcome, that's what we need. So that itself is quite telling. And I think what we need to really create is a system that allows for the payment situation where the prices actually go down. Okay, right. Uh, so moving on, uh, do you think that a sort of increased formalization of the economy and access to a national health insurance system could be part of the way forward for Sri Lanka's welfare system? Yeah, I think uh, formalizing the, so about, if you take Sri Lanka's labor force, about uh, only about 30% of them are working in formal, uh, formal uh, roles or formal uh, workplaces. So the rest of the 60%, about two thirds, are doing informal work, right? Uh, so the difficulty is when, uh, when you talk from an administrative point of view is that, um, you know, you don't, you really don't know what people are doing, essentially. Uh, and this makes it very difficult to identify people who actually may need uh, social security, uh, you know, uh, social safety, essentially. Um, so if we take, for example, the formal, uh, formal workforce, uh, the, 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 there's essentially the private formal workforce and the public sector. So the public sector, for example, is covered, if you take old age pensions, uh, they are covered by a civil pensions program. Uh, and there is, although it's not a pension program, there is the EPF and the ETF uh, for private sector workers. But there, there is essentially, uh, you know, little to nothing for informal sector workers. There are a few programs like the fishermen and farmers uh, pension programs, uh, which I think now are sort of defunct. They are not operating anymore. Uh, so, and a few like other very, uh, you know, ad hoc uh, programs like uh, for uh, artists and uh, for craftsmen uh, programs like this. Uh, so I think there are, definitely needs to be a formalization. Now, I, I can't really speak about how that would work, but definitely, uh, you know, uh, so that we are able to actually identify, uh, you know, people when they are in need. Uh, for example, if you are in the former sector and you meet with an accident and you're not able to work anymore, uh, you know, there's literally no social uh, safety net for you. Uh, whereas if you were in the private sector and, you know, if you were in an accident, then there might be 
you know if you if you work for a company which has an insurance policy then you would be able to get uh, some sort of some sort of financial support uh, so i think there are uh, you know there are definitely benefits to formalizing the economy uh, that we need to start thinking about and i think in the long t- uh, i mean if you look at historically obviously now we are in a crisis situation but historically also Uh, there's been very little done by subject you know uh, successive governments to really address these uh, administrative problems when it comes to running uh, you know social safety programs uh, for example uh, uh, like gaini said earlier about mobile money or bank transfers you know it was more you know it very like it was it happened in a very crawling pace right so now we are in a situation where we are trying to you know uh, give out cash benefits and reduce our administrative cost at the same time uh, but if we had actually done uh, taken the adequate steps all this time to get to a point where we are able to disburse uh, cash payments with very low administrative cost then we would be facing this situation so i think uh, it's a good lesson for sri lanka Uh, for the future to you know not to wait until the sort of crunch time to address the problems but to you know make incremental um, significant incremental changes right thank you as they say hindsight is 2020 i suppose yes um, <laughs> uh so sri lanka's chronic budget deficit is part of the problem behind the present crisis uh how do you all think the government should balance its expenditure while simultaneously protecting welfare recipients particularly public se- sector pension recipients uh rehana um so i think if you look at the government's uh revenue expenditure a large portion of that uh, i think uh well last year it was about 70% i think of government revenue was going towards uh uh well it, it it is equivalent to uh government's uh, salary and pensions bill uh, so i think uh you know they they are so that is a big amount and that is an obligatory amount not something you can uh, you know cut down overnight uh and then there are obviously variety of other uh, uh programs like samudhi and uh, you know other uh social uh, sec- security programs that you can't cut down but there definitely i think from the capital expenditure side there are uh there there is merit in looking at how can you curtail these and i think definitely it needs to happen because sri lanka can't maintain such high expenditures uh you know at a time like this i mean we are in a situation where the government doesn't even have uh money to pay salaries and pensions so they are having to uh, you know uh, go out and borrow it or print money which is which makes things worse for everybody in the long term um so yeah i think you know definitely <laughs> needs to be needs to be looked at yeah and i suppose it needs to be looked at as part of a broader context of the government increasing its tax base and other necessary economic reforms yes the uh, issue with the uh, yeah on taxes i just like to say definitely sri lankan government needs to improve its uh, taxes we need to uh, you know we you know i think many people don't know this but sri lanka was last year the lowest tax paying country in the entire world uh, which is quite ridiculous uh, so obviously you can see when you are having such high government expenditure and no revenue obviously that means you have to borrow but then when you're sort of locked out of uh, international finance markets you can't really do that uh, so definitely the tax tax uh, sorry re- revenue side needs to be looked at but there are certain administrative issues even when it comes to uh, the revenue side of the government uh, for example i think uh, there was an article this sunday in the paper that the tax authority doesn't have a director general in place a commissioner general so it's good i mean you know these kinds of administrative issues are going to make it that much harder even if you have a proper policy in place it's going to make it that much harder to actually collect uh, the revenue uh, 
so yeah, definitely the revenue side needs to be looked at, but there are so many administrative problems that, you know, sort of low hanging administrative problems that need uh, to be solved ASAP. Right. Uh, thank you for that answer on a very comprehensive. Uh, Gani, do you have anything to contribute? Uh, I mean, not much. I think Prahana covered most of it. But, you know, just to reiterate that it's it's a twofold thing, right? You need to increase your revenue and try, you know, uh, reduce your expenditure, rationalize your expenditure, and make sure you spend where best is needed, right? So it needs to happen in tandem. Uh, in When we talk about increasing revenue, we often talk about increasing tax revenue, but we also need to think about increasing non-tax revenue, right, through all these other mechanisms as well. So that's uh, that's an area that I think we don't have spent enough time on. We do need to, again, focus on improving our tax collection mechanisms, which has been uh, abysmal over the past couple of years, uh, particularly like pay and uh, advanced personal income tax, like that kind of thing was something that really uh, helped increase our uh, direct tax base, uh, kind of went down with the 2019 uh, reforms and, you know, things things just went south from there. So the, the uh, proposals that came out in early June, uh, really, which goes back to the old tax regime, is a step in the right direction. And we do need to kind of continue to go down that path because um, we can't quite... Um, go back to what it was uh, over the past couple of years because, you know, that's really untenable. And uh, also yeah. touching on the previous point which we spoke about formalizing the economy, I think that's again where these programs like pay and all, uh, you know, exist, but you can only sort of, you know, uh, you know, you can only implement those for people in the formal, formal workforce. You can't really implement that for people in the informal workforce. Uh, so again, uh, you know, all of these are sort of cross-cutting issues that, uh, you know, need to be resolved. Absolutely. And just yeah. to add that, there are also many people who are, you know, very high income earners, doctors, lawyers, and so on, who do get large chunks of money, but aren't subject to things like pay. So we do need to think of how we uh, collect taxes from those sort of individuals as well to level the playing field in that sense. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's, that all makes a lot of sense. And uh, finally, to sort of round off our discussion, um, a proposal which many people think is a sort of a pie in the sky goal, especially for a country like Sri Lanka, is the implementation of a UBI scheme. Uh, UBI or universal basic income would advocate for everyone in the country to receive a fixed amount of money every month that would help to cover their cost of living. Uh, do you think that this is at all tenable in our present economic situation? Uh, I mean, I, I could go first. And I, I, I do understand uh, why there is a school of thought that thinks that uh, that would be effective. Um, it would be the easiest way of making sure that everyone gets some money, right? So that's uh, sort of the, 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 the issue that people are trying to solve over there. But I'm a, I'm a strong advocate of making sure that uh, we make sure that the limited resources that we have, which is really the problem that we're dealing with, is best spent and directed towards the people who really need it, right? And I'll just use an example for this. Uh, say uh, 5,000 rupees is given, and I'll use 5,000 rupees because that's usually what's just given out these days. Uh, say somebody, uh, the poorest of the poor, say in Monragula, would get 5,000 rupees, and that would the UBI scheme would mean that the richest of the rich, some uh, living in Colombo, would also get 5,000 rupees, right? Um, and the marginal utility that the person in uh, Monragula, the poorest of poor, would get from that would be significantly more. So what we need to do, and you know, the, the, the rich person in Colombo isn't really going to get much from that at all. So it makes much more sense to take that 5,000 rupees, give it to the person who is in Monragula and give them 10,000 rupees because they could do so much more with that money. So uh, given that we are in a severely resource constrained situation, uh, given that we live in a country with a lot of inequality to begin with, Sri Lanka has the highest Gini coefficient in all of South Asia. Um, this sort of program won't really um, try to 
deal with that problem. So resource constraint, high inequality, uh, I would uh, tend towards using uh, means testing and giving it to the poor. Right. Thank you. Uh, Rehana, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree with uh, what Gayani has said. I think uh, particularly the, the resource problem, we, I mean, we all know that there's a huge fiscal, uh, you know, fiscal problem in the country. Uh, first of all, I think we can't afford a universal basic income program in Sri Lanka. So uh, we have to use whatever resources we have. We really have to target it uh, to the people who uh, you know, really desperately need it. Uh, and they are in like severe need at the moment. Uh, secondly, I think given Sri Lanka's um, uh, income inequality, which Gaini mentioned, I think about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something like 70 70% of uh, total household income is uh, enjoyed by the top uh, top 40%, top 30 or 40% of households. Uh, and, you know, the poorest, uh, the rest of the households only have about 25 or 30% of household income. So if you go and you target, uh, you know, you give a uh, universal basic uh, income program, I think we, we are going to end up wasting resources because, uh, you know, as Gaini mentioned, uh, People who have really high incomes, five thousand is nothing for them. It it will probably just sit in their bank account, uh, you know, doing nothing. Whereas somebody who's poor um, would really, you know, go out and use that money for their daily expenses. Uh, and also, I think the targeting. Uh, say you have a pool of money, and your options are to do a targeted program or a, a UBI program. I think if you do a UBI program, then it sort of dilutes the the per Per beneficiary value that you can really give out to people, uh, whereas if you do uh, a cash transfer, sorry, um, uh, you know, a targeted program, then you can actually give more to people who actually need that money. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, even in general, I don't agree with universal basic income, but particularly in Sri Lanka's current uh, context. I think it's completely not uh, not tenable at all, given Sri Lanka's highly, highly restricted fiscal space. Okay, thank you. And uh, that brings us to the end of our discussion. Uh, do either of you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I just like to say, you know, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I think, as you said earlier, hindsight is a lot clearer. And I think we can see uh, sort of the mistakes that we have made, uh, even with regard to social security, we have failed to address the targeting problem. So now we are in a situation where we can't even identify uh, the people who genuinely need uh, the social security, uh, you know, cash transfers. Uh, you know, and that's not a problem that we can solve overnight. Uh, you know, if we had done uh, what should have been done over the course of, you know, the longer term, then we would have been in a better position. So I think these are all good lessons for us to take forward and, you know, not to wait until a crisis hits to try to resolve these problems. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it all goes back to uh, you know, what do we expect from our politicians and, you know, the, rule, uh, the leaders and, uh, you know, government. Uh, so it really, uh, a lot of systematic issues that need to be solved. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't do it overnight. But hopefully, when Sri Lanka does emerge out of this crisis, we don't sort of lapse back into that, uh, you know, complacent sort of lifestyle, and then we do actually push for policy changes that can address these systematic problems. Yeah, absolutely. This whole situation has been a valuable lesson for your generation and for mine. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think you we are in the same generation, for... no? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, I'm in Gen Z and yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. And thank you especially to Rehana and Gaini for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, Advocata will be hosting more live discussions like this. So stay tuned in the following weeks by uh, looking at our social media pages for more content like this. Have a wonderful evening and stay safe.
Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.